we want to be able to say this component's responsible for some behavior or like some piece of knowledge in the model. We basically carried out an analysis where we found current methods for saying, okay, layer five is responsible for storing this fact in this large transformer model. But if you want to change what the model says, you could add a layer 10, you could add a layer one and still change what the model says. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by Peter Hasse. Peter is a PhD student at the UNC NLP lab at the University of North Carolina. Before we get going, be sure to take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sam. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited for our conversation. We're going to be talking broadly about your research interests, which span topics like interpretability, uh, models as belief storage, scalable oversight. Take us to the next level of detail. Tell us about how you think about your research and your uh, research agenda. There really are three areas I'd, I'd pick out that uh, we focused on uh, dur during my PhD research. First, broadly, interpretability. Uh, you know, this is all about understanding the internal reasoning processes that language models are using as they solve problems, as they answer our questions. Uh, you know, I think this is not only really fascinating, but also really important as we seek to know, you know, can we trust the internal reasoning that's going on in these models? Is, is it the kind of reasoning that we think is good and we, and we will generalize in, in the ways we intend? That's the first area. And then the second, this model editing problem has been, you know, it's gone through kind of a resurgence in popularity since 2020, 2021. It's all about updating individual factual knowledge and beliefs in language models. Uh, also really interesting, also practically important, if not only just to keep language models up to date, there's also other kinds of use cases like deleting things we might not want them to know. And then lastly, another kind of particularly safety oriented area is this scalable oversight problem, where here we're focused on understanding how can we supervise and how can we evaluate AI systems as they get better and better at solving tasks um, to, to the point where potentially, you know, we might not even know the answers to a problem ourselves. And, and we still want to be able to uh, supervise a model and, and steer it in a certain direction or better calibrate our own trust and like, okay, should I trust, you know, this answer being correct or not? Do you think of the work in the interpretability domain as kind of the most fundamental of the three? In a sense, uh, to the degree you can figure that out, it makes the other two tasks much easier. Oh, that's, that's a good question. Long term, yes, but in the same sense that like, oh, neuroscience long term is like the explanation for everything we do, right? Because it's like, that's how the brain works. It's it's It can be so low level, especially if you're thinking about mechanistic interpretability, that if you care about certain safety problems, there can just be other potentially more direct avenues to, to, to uh, solving some of these safety problems or thinking about yeah, properly supervising models. You don't always need to know the individual you know, underlying mechanism behind every behavior you're interested in steering in, in a neural network. And in fact, historically, that's not the way it's done because historically we just set up, here's the objective function that we want to optimize. Here's what we care about. Let's make sure we're optimizing this end-to-end -end black box system for this objective function you know, properly. And, and when we're testing the system, we're actually testing all the cases that we care about. You know, Really the way progress is typically achieved is not by understanding all the little individual internal mechanisms behind everything. Uh, even though long-term you might think yes. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, so talk us through some of the uh, individual projects within interpretability that you've been working on. Yeah. So one in the past uh, couple of years that, that we put out through uh, some work I did while I was at Google, I uh, was focused especially on understanding, you know, what, what do we learn when we say this component in a neural network is responsible for storing this fact? So this is called like knowledge localization or, or localization and, and um, you know interpretability. We want to be able to say this component, even, even this neuron in, in a model potentially, we might get that granular. This component's responsible for some behavior or like some piece of knowledge in the model that, that we know the model has. Um, so you know some of the work we did here, people are really excited about connections between this kind of interpretability research and model editing research. The idea being, okay, you want to edit a fact in a model. Okay. First, you should know where the fact is stored, and then that should help you edit the fact in the model. Um, I'm still, I still think this is broadly the correct narrative going forward. But you know, it, we did a, we basically carried out an analysis where we found there might have been like a false start in this direction. 
So we found that some current methods for saying, okay, now, layer five is responsible for storing this fact in this large transformer model. But if you want to change what the model says in response to a question about the fact, you can actually go in and edit a different layer inside the model. You could edit layer 10 instead and still change what the model says. Or you could edit layer one, even though you're pretty sure the fact was stored at layer five. So, so this, this is you know, pretty unintuitive in this view that you know, facts are stored in specific places and, and neural networks. Um, stepping back a bit, we're thinking probably that's not exactly the right narrative for, for how the models work. Uh, and, and in this case, there was a, a little bit of a disconnection between the interpretability result and the model editing application. Are you saying that you question the fundamental idea that knowledge is stored in a particular place in a complex neural network, but rather it's you know distributed more broadly within that network? Well, really, yeah, that's a that's a fair criticism, I think, uh, because you know previously one of the notions of like why neural networks were successful um, is is the is the view that okay there are distributed representations in, in neural networks and um, and particularly, we know that residual uh, layers, residual connections were really important for scaling neural networks up. And, um, you know, transformers are, are built with these kinds of residual layers such that information just tends to flow across the entire network. And each individual layer in a model can add or remove information from what's called a residual stream. The overall system here ends up looking quite different from how you might imagine like, okay, like, you know, a cell or like an engine, like a motor engine working where like this component has this job and it's both necessary and sufficient for carrying out this function. And if it breaks, then the whole thing definitely breaks. Current transformers don't really work like that where, you know, you can eliminate a component and the system is surprisingly robust. You can add noise and the system might still be surprisingly robust. Yeah, as much as the parallels between neural networks and the brain are, you know, sometimes over overplayed, uh, that is a parallel, right? You know, there is information or capability that's localized, but uh, we've also seen that um, the brain can compensate if a particular area is damaged in some way. Mm, yeah, that's that's an interesting connection for sure. Yeah, and and in fact, even you know, some research is is really leaning into this localization angle, uh, and and asking the question: Well, maybe the information isn't localized by default, but maybe we can encourage it to be more localized. So so that way, you know, we we build a system that that better resembles other other more mechanical systems we're used to working with, and and so maybe it'll be actually be easier to go in and edit uh, the the system's behavior once once we've designed it to be more editable to begin with. And so when you talk about localization, uh, what's the granularity that you looked at? Are you looking at, you know, particular weights or activations or, you know, modules or layers as a whole? Uh, how deep, how far did you go with that? Yeah, we went down to the layer level thinking about specific, um, you know, the outputs of specific, uh, in this case, MLP or attention uh, layers in the transformer, which, you know, is, is, I would say, a very intermediate level of granularity. You can go all the way down to the neuron. You can, there's been a lot of research showing that the neuron isn't necessarily the right uh, unit of analysis, but, but there's something that's called like a, you know, a direction and latent space or kind of a latent direction or a feature direction that is more so like the right unit. And um, that, that, that is closely related to, you know, just the outputs of, of the layers themselves. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the more granular you get, uh, kind of the, the bigger the, the search space becomes. So when you're, when you're talking about knocking out, uh, you know, doing a kind of causal intervention on a layer versus a neuron, you know, your model might only have 30 layers. Uh, it's it's going to have like, you know, maybe 30 times 1,000 or 30 times 4,000 or more uh, neurons. Uh, so, so at that point, if when you're thinking about, you know, searching through intervention space, uh, things particularly in any kind of combinatorial way, things could get a little bit more complicated. The paper that we're referring to, does localization inform editing, surprising differences in causality-based localization versus knowledge editing and language models? Did I get the right one? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And this surprising part there was, you know, we definitely saw it seemed like this fact was stored, you know, basically between layers like five and, and 10 or so. And you can get the model to say something different by editing layer one or like layer 15 sometimes. So, and, and, and we think, you know, we're speculating, actually, we can't run the experiments 
uh, necessarily immediately. Uh, the, the, the key piece there is these residual layers where the model between layers five and 10, the model wants to say one thing, you can go in before or after and inject information into that residual stream that ultimately changes the model's downstream answer, even though you haven't touched like the original information store, so to speak. And you reference and the title of the paper references uh, causality or causal modeling based approach. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the way you set up the problem from a causal perspective? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the fundamental workhorse of interpretability research right now is be being able to do causal interventions on components and models and exactly measure the effect on a kind of behavior you're interested in. So the specific method we were looking at for localization is called causal tracing. It's kind of a denoising ablation. Um, you can think of the, the, the most common forms of ablations here are like knocking a component out. So that's like taking a neuron and setting its value to zero. You, you knock that neuron out from the network. Uh, so, so you can think of that as you know a zeroing ablation or a noising ablation. You could add noise to the neuron's activation such that the maybe the rest of the model can't really like you know it's not a typical value to the rest of the model any longer. So, causal tracing, kind of a new and and, and fancy approach and, and successful approach to to um, you know this this particular form of analysis of localizing facts focuses on denoising. This is still a causal intervention, but it happens that you know the, the the twist here is that first you noise the input to the model. So now the the model's kind of getting this like in this uh, noisy information input that's given to it. If you have a question that's like, where is the space needle? Or like you might input a prompt to the model that says the space needle is located in, and that's the whole prompt. You would go in and, and you know, when, when the model sees space needle, what that transformer sees are word embeddings or token embeddings. And you'd actually take those token embeddings and add Gaussian noise to them. It's as if the model sees like the, you know, this fuzzy subject entity, this kind of, this noisy thing, is located in blank. And so it's like, okay, well, I'm, I'm clearly being asked where something is located, or I need to figure out where something's located, but I don't know what the thing is. And so the denoising part here, it says, okay, where can I go in and substitute the clean space needle representation inside the model, such that the model arrives at its original answer of Seattle. And so it'll, it'll happen that if you go in and substitute, maybe between layers five and 10, you go and kind of denoise those representations, the model once again understands, okay, now I need to say Seattle. And so you, you think that, okay, when you do that, it's like these components seem to be uh, sufficient at arriving for the original answer. The connection to knowledge editing is kind of the one we alluded to earlier, that if you know where the information is, then that gives you some leverage to edit it and, and change the, the output. That's the intuition. And I think that's a really reasonable intuition. And I'm optimistic about this intuition in the long term. But we, we need to be building, uh, you know, I'm going to be saying the word causal probably in a few different senses, but we need to be building our, our own better causal models of how these transformers work, which is to say, we, we, need, we need a clear overall picture about what kind of system the transformer is. When, when we're asking a question like, where is this fact stored? There's, there's, uh, you know, that question presupposes a lot about how the system actually works. Like facts could be represented by individual vectors, or there could be individual like buckets or bins inside the system or storages or registries that are responsible for storing those, like, you know, whatever language the fact is written in, like if it's a vector, it's responsible for storing that vector. Um, and, and it's like, it's uniquely necessary and sufficient for, for that function inside of the, the model where we're, we're realizing just increasingly that's not really how transformers work. So, so we actually need to figure out, okay, what are the questions we're supposed to be asking that, such that we can get like a sensible answer? The second broad area of research interest for you is um, model editing and that the implication is that you know knowing how things are represented or knowing where a particular piece of knowledge sits in a model is not the only way to do it, and there are other ways to do it, and you're looking at some of those other ways. Tell us a little bit more about how you've approached that area. Absolutely, and and the other ways are really more traditional because because traditionally how machine learning has worked is you you treat your model, your neural network, at this least in deep learning, as an a black box end-to-end -end differentiable function. 
And the way that you train your neural network to do something you want it to do is you give it data and you write down an objective function and you, you optimize the objective function such that the, the final system is, is just better at being able to give you the outputs you want for the inputs that you're giving it. And so this is exactly a recipe you can follow with updating, you know, for instance, factual information and in models. So if it happens that, uh, okay, some of the most common examples are like sports players, get, you know, professional athletes get traded between teams all the time. Uh, so, you know, okay, well now we need to update, uh, you know, this player plays on this team and this player plays on, on this team and, and this uh, language model. We don't, you know, this language model costs between $10 million and $100 million. We don't know, it's all proprietary to train, uh, but when we wanna update this fact and, and the model. Um, well, you know, just traditionally the way you would do that is you say, okay, well, here are a bunch of questions that involve that knowledge. And, the, you know, we wanna, rather than the model saying the name of the old team, we want the model to say the name of the new team. So let's just train the model to do that. And, and this is, this is exact. You use the off the shelf optimizers that have been a ton of work has gone into making these optimizers really well suited to, to the architectures we have and the kind of data distributions we have. You don't necessarily need to know anything about the internal mechanism that the model's using to get the answer correct. It's just black box optimization. And so when you say, train meaning you know training with the the new questions and answers are you referring to you know pre-training or ground up training or are you referring to fine tuning really more of a fine tuning step you'd be working with a pre-trained model and the part where you're updating it is doing just a little bit of last tweaking of the way it's just a little bit of fine tuning to to be able to update that knowledge inside the model Another area where this uh, desire to edit comes up is in the case of, um, you know, models that have factual data that you want to delete. I'm thinking in particular of like, uh, you know, more visual models that have information, you know, about an artist and that artist wants to be taken out of the model. Same broad problem, like you don't want to have to retrain the model. The approaches are ultimately similar. And, and I really care about this problem. And this is something we've done some work on. The idea of deleting information from, from models is, is increasingly important, you know, particularly because of these huge pre-training costs. But, you know, it's, it's just, even, even if you're training things from scratch, we're, we're still going to want to be able to particularly avoid, you know, copyrighted information, information that is, is, you know, simply, you know, not owned by, by the model trainer or model developer, but maybe accidentally made it into the pre-training data set, these like large scale web scraping activities, um, other kinds of sensitive or potentially dangerous information. Uh, we've, we've seen some early studies from OpenAI and RAND suggest that models probably aren't that helpful at helping people build bioweapons. Uh, but at the same time, the models are learning a lot more about biology uh, every year and, and doing better and better at answering all kinds of questions there. And, and I think there's some legitimate concern um, in the short to long term, somewhere in the middle there, uh, about models just simply having like potentially dangerous uh, information. And, you know, the other half of that obviously is being able to explain it really well to people if they're jailbroken or, or if, if they're, you know, in this kind of chatbot form. So I, I really care, you know, this, I think this deletion problem is just pretty critical going forward and how people are doing that. Yeah. So, so again, you know, there's nothing really new under the sun and, and machine learning as, as, as far as I can tell this, this uh, machine unlearning area has, has been really active for a long time. People have cared about privacy and systems for a really long time, you know, going back to the two thousands, early two thousands, there's seminal work on, you have a database and you trained a model on the database, but someone simply requests that their records be deleted from the database. So now how, how do you, how do you change the model to, to respect their privacy in, the, in this setting and a lot of the methods here you know it's it's really all some form of fine tuning uh i would say that the um the thing if, if you want one umbrella term that ties together the traditional fine tuning methods and the new state-of-the-art model editing methods it's constrained fine tuning you're you're doing some some kind of traditional fine tuning process but you might sort of have some additional constraint on which weights can I edit? What is the overall size of the edit I can make to the model? What are other constraints I need to respect in order to not change the model too much, make the edit more targeted or, or surgical? Uh, yeah, but I, I'd say constrained fine tuning is the umbrella. What's the Venn diagram between constrained fine tuning and parameter efficient fine tuning? 
No, this is a, a good observation because really they're the same thing. They just often have different goals, I think. So the perimeter efficient fine tuning world for a while. This is Laura, Q Laura, Dora. And, and the main goal there is like doing uh, fine tuning in a more performant way. More performant, uh, less memory, uh, faster, potentially more sample efficient. These, these uh, are, are all current, uh, basically observed benefits of a lot of these uh, fine tuning methods like LoRa. I remember when some of these methods were, were initially being developed, again, going back to 2020, 2021, I was a little confused because often they might update only 1% of a model's memory, or of a, sorry, model's parameters, but they use slightly more memory and are slightly slower. So I, I didn't really understand, but but I think I think some of the more ML uh, engineering people uh, basically really figured this one out, and now they're faster and more memory efficient, and let you. I mean, one of the huge benefits here is being able to, if you want to train, you know, a hundred different models, you don't need to store a hundred different models. You only store a hundred sets of LoRa parameters, and it's it's super lightweight and storage efficient too. A lot of the big Providers like uh, AWS and Google call these lower parameters adapters. And so the idea is that individual customers can fine tune on their own data without them needing to have, you know, tens of thousands, millions of copies of these large models. Yeah. But in fact, some of the modeling methods work almost exactly the same. You might be doing, so Laura does these, you know, low rank updates to some, some subset of, of layers in a model. Um, you know, some of the method, this model editing methods like Mimit is an example where if you want to update multiple facts over time, you can use this method called Mimit. Mimit does low rank updates to specific matrices in the model. And so it's almost exactly the same idea, uh, I think, at the, at the end of the day as, as Laura. Yeah. And, but Mimit is an approach that's used more in the context of editing than in efficient tuning. Yeah. And this goes back to difference in basically stated goals, when in fact, the underlying approaches are quite similar. You reference existing state-of-the-art model editing methods, uh, such as ROAM. Uh, what is ROAM? How does ROAM work? So it's actually quite similar to MIMA. There are these super constrained kind of updates you can make to the model. I mean, when you're talking like rank one for a matrix that is like, uh, you know, it's actually like 16K by 4K. So the rank's at least 4K. So so it's like a it's like quite a high dimensional kind of weight space you could be editing and you're editing, you know, more or less one of those dimensions. You're, this is an extremely surgical edit to the model. And, and you know, basically it's improved a ton over all the off the shelf black box approaches we, we've been talking about before um, in, in terms of the ability to, to update the, the facts in the model. And it strikes me that it's a little bit of. Uh, it's not that surprising that you could edit surgically, but it's maybe surprising that you can figure out where to apply the surgical edit. Yeah, I mean, this comes back to the localization part here. So because they're working at, you know, Rome was at a layer level. Um, in fact, you can just try all the layers. So so this, this I think, turns out is, is the reason, you know, basically it, um, this is the tuning step that led it to work, you know, as well as it did. It works, it works well across different layers, but, you know, just getting that last little bump. The second step, that's when you're editing an individual fact. So you're saying, okay, the space needle located in Seattle, or maybe we put the space needle in London. So, so you do a little bit of optimization in order to change where the space needle is located in the model. And so there's, yeah, there's a little bit of a learning thing going on there where you're actually saying, okay, here, here's the matrix and its old output was this vector, but we want the new output to be this other vector, which basically, you know, gets the model to say London. And now we figure out how should we change the matrix to reflect that new information. So, so that's like the inference time kind of learning. Um, there is interestingly this pre-computation step, which um, I, th I think, I think maybe some more experiments are showing, you know, exactly how valuable this pre-computation is, but um, the, the model actually, and, and what they do is they scan over some data from Wikipedia and they say, okay, what, what does the internal distribution of these latent states typically look like? So, you know, you could have all these different vectors coming into this matrix and you want to get a sense of what that distribution of vectors looks like. And that, that is, that basically forms one term in their update equation. So, so that's kind of just like a mathematical necessity they are borrowing 
uh, David Bao is borrowing um, an older model from neuroscience, a computational neuroscience called linear associative memory. So it's kind of, a, it's actually a comp neuro inspired method. And linear associative memories rely on uh, understanding the distribution of inputs to your memory matrix. And so in order to do that, they run the model of Wikipedia, compute what that distribution looks like. And then that distribution always, that's stored in memory and that gets called during the inference time optimization. And so that having been said, what did this particular paper of yours uh, go on to explore? Yeah, so the on the you know practical side here, we are adapting these model editing methods, not for just, you know, really the predominant way these things have been used and tested too is, so let's say we ha- we know where the space needle is. Let's change it from Seattle to London. Well, it's a somewhat artificial thing to do. I mean, why would you want to do that? Like, why would you want to just like get the model to believe a bunch of false things? Believe it or not, that is the way academics were often benchmarking these methods. So, so uh, it's not necessarily the most practical thing. Uh, but we we definitely do want to be able to delete information from models. Uh, you know, for all the reasons we we talked about before. So, you know, the very first thing we did was just change the problem. And say, okay, let's let's think about deleting all these pieces of factual information from the model. Like they're not exactly the kinds of dangerous information we care about ultimately. In fact, uh, very recently, the Center for AI Safety just released a data set of a bunch of like questions about you know biology and, and protein synthesis that they in- are encouraging researchers to work on in this area of machine unlearning. But prior to that, we were just deleting you know random trivia facts from from the models. Um, and that's the first thing we did was you know, kind of change the problem to this deletion problem, but adapt existing model editing methods for this problem. Um, and, and I could say a little bit more about the, kind of the, the threat model too, although uh, we've already talked about the context of yeah, sometimes models know things you don't want them to. I'm imagining then you set up some evaluation criteria, um, you know, that is almost maybe like you just want negative performance against a set of known questions for the model. Yeah, almost exactly like that, because you just don't want the model to get the answer correct anymore that it previously knew. Uh, but so he, he, here's our adjustment to the evaluation, uh, because if if someone's working with a chatbot and they're asking for, OK, you know, someone's personal information or or this particular or copyrighted data, like, oh, I want you to give me, you know, this thing that like normally have to pay for or something um, or like just, you know, all the other reasons we were thinking about, uh, you know, are they just going to try once and then, and then give up if they don't get the answer they want? Um, probably not. They'll probably try a bunch of times. Um, they might use more sophisticated kind of black box pair rephrasing, paraphrasing attacks. Um, some, something we look at the paper is white box attacks, which means, okay, what if someone, what if someone can't get the information they're looking for out of chat GPT? But Mistral just released a new state-of-the-art model, which is, you know, within a few points of ChatGPT on a bunch of benchmarks. And so they just download the Mistral model and then go, uh, you know, we, we have some some white box attacks where even, you know, you could have a, a company actually claim that we scrubbed all the private, sensitive, copyrighted information from a model. We, we, we trained the model. And, you know, just in case we went through when we, and we, when we were doing our RLHF or when we were doing our last fine tuning step, we made sure that the model would not answer questions about this, these sensitive topics. Okay. Actually, so what we did in our paper was we do that kind of thing. We, we fine tune the model and make sure it's not going to answer the question based, based on this, this kind of facts you don't want the model to answer questions about. You can go inside the model and look at its latent states and still get the answer out. You can screw up the classification layer at the end and make the model do a very poor job at classification, but all of the information that is in the model that allows it to do classification when you haven't done that is unchanged and is still there. Exactly. I mean, I think I think that's a perfect analogy. What goes on in some of these kinds of like post hoc safety fine tuning methods is that they're basically just doing something like messing up the last few layers, getting the model to not say the thing when the model still knows the information. That, that you don't want. And to. so did you identify a method to more deeply erase the knowledge from the network? Okay, there are internal representations in the model that's, you know, the model still knows the answer. Let's go through and wherever we can detect any information about the answer, let's delete it. So we go through it in multiple in locations inside the model and make sure that those intermediate representations also do not contain any of the sensitive information that you're trying to delete. 
and and ultimately it's like yeah the mo- you still get the same kind of text behavior where like the model doesn't say the answer but now it's going to be robust to your white box attack and when you're trying to probe those intermediate layers you've also scrubbed the information from those intermediate layers and identifying which of those layers had the information is through the same kind of probes a similar kind of probing that an attacker might use anyway this this is a always going to be one of the assumptions that that we make in this kind of like adversarial security uh research um you you know we will pick examples of what we think are plausible like attack vectors uh but we don't know like the whole space of attack methods and there's an ongoing concern about okay what if there's some kind of asymmetry here or what if the attacker what if what if the you know defense is always one step behind the the adversarial attacks. We design one attack and see how well we can defend against that one attack, but we had secretly designed a second attack. And then we see how well our defense defends against the second attack that it like wasn't necessarily designed to defend against. And we saw some settings where like, you know, the second attack, um, you know, the the defense definitely helped protect a decent amount against it, but like maybe the second attack was still slightly more successful than, than the first one. Definitely still seems like there could be some of these like cat and mouse dynamics. One of the approaches to changing information is, you know, you just retune on a bunch of facts that say that the Eiffel Tower is in London. Um, but is that even viable for deletion? I mean, I guess you can, it would then be more like, instruction tuning where it's like you're training the model if they get asked about where the eiffel tower is to just say i don't know if you feel like you're questioning you know your assumptions about how this stuff works it's because you know researchers are also actively questioning all the assumptions about (laughs) how this stuff works (laughs) and it's like oh is this model editing stuff just fine tuning versus uh, oh is this fine tuning stuff just instruction following it's like actually they're all kind of related <laughs> okay fair. And, i appreciate that and, and yeah it's very gracious yeah yeah it's, <laughs> the goal is that there's a question and we don't want the model to say the answer to the question and and so yeah a lot of a lot of these methods do look like uh getting some data getting some example questions and doing some optimization but th- again it's this constrained fine tuning Constrained fine tuning is the optimization in order to say, for all these questions, don't say the answer. But but this is this is something that is we characterize just as black box defense, because you're just getting it to not say the answer. You aren't that approach is not sufficiently safe if the model weights are public. Because if the model weights are public, then people can do white box attacks. And 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 that's something we show where if someone's able to go and download your llama or your mistral, you can claim you did safety fine tuning. You can claim you you deleted something, but if, um, unless you use a method more like one we pitch, where you actually you're trying to delete that information everywhere inside the model, you really not, might not be prepared for those white box attacks. And there's still one last you know ongoing concern about cat and mouse dynamics. So yeah, you know we you used this one kind of deletion method. But what if there's a new extraction probe that someone develops? So like, you know, you weren't quite prepared for it. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about one last paper and in, in research area. And this is the work in uh, scalable oversight, um, which you kind of characterize as safety. It seems you know a bit different from the other two areas, which seem tightly related. Uh, is that fair characterization? So let me set up the problem first, which is, uh, so we have data distributions like, and, and by that, I mean, you know, basically benchmarks, or you can think of MMLU. So this is a popular benchmark for, for language models. It tests how much they know about a bunch of other different uh, individual kind of domains of human knowledge. You know, you can think there's like grade school, high school level math questions in there. And then there's like law questions and like medicine and questions in there too. And um, so, um, it's it's expensive to collect these data sets. You actually have to hire, you know, s- experts in a sense for sure, like people with law degrees or, or people with like at least like a bachelor's and and you know, chemistry to answer your college level chemistry test questions. Um, and you hire multiple of these people because you get multiple people to try to answer the questions, and then you see, okay, like does everyone agree on what the answer is? You know, if they do, great, we trust it more. Um, so uh, p- people are, you know, you want to be able to do a little bit of at least a little bit of fine tuning to be able to take a language model and like tailor it to a setting like this 
we know that actually surprisingly pre-trained models are often pretty good at just answering these kinds of domain specific questions you can take a pre-trained model that hasn't gone through any rlhf or any fine tuning and just use it to answer these questions and it'll you know it might get like 45 percent accuracy or 50 percent accuracy what is the the motivation for easy to hard generalization it's well collecting that labeled data can be difficult you need people with law degrees you need people with college degrees and you might need to hire five of them per question in order to make sure they all agree and make sure yeah the answer is actually you know definitely correct what if we are able to train the models just on easy data and they still do well on the hard data that's just that's just the question is like is it possible how well would it work because we know that actually the off the shelf just pre-trained models might get 50% of the questions and if we were able to do fine tuning we might get 65% or 60% but the question is between so that's like the there's the floor is just the pre-trained model and the ceiling like the oracle ceiling is you're able to fine tune on hard questions with true labels you know, correctly labeled data and then basically the thing we test in the paper is what if you just have easy data what if you don't have college level chemistry questions but what if, what if you have high school chemistry questions or what if you have eighth grade science questions you know, even I know the answers to the eighth grade science questions. What if you could give that training data to the model? How well would it do? How much of that performance gap would be recovered by that kind of process? And you've got these structured data sets at each of these levels. So you can kind of successively go back further and see what, uh, you know, how much advantage you give up by going further and further from the level, uh, the target level. Exactly. This is made possible by having a lot of metadata. And some of the biggest hardness gaps we measure are going all the way from third grade level science questions to college level STEM questions. And, and you know, the, the fun and surprising result we get there is that uh, you can train a model on the third grade questions and it does generalize better to the college level questions. We still see actually positive, easy to hard transfer going from third grade to college. When you characterize it as, you know, third grade, fourth grade, nth grade, college, um, you know, it, I think we all can kind of intuitively relate to the idea of hardness. But the paper does even ask this question, like, do we really know how to measure hardness and uh, are there different approaches? Talk a little bit about what you saw there. Absolutely. Yeah. So so I definitely want to you know highlight here that um, our study here, I see as totally the tip of the iceberg into this kind of question of easy to hard generalization, because we are using existing data sets with existing intuitive notions of hardness, like grade level, some, you know, a few of the other things we look at, how long a question is, how long an answer is to a question. Uh, we have some math problems where people write down the intermediate steps to reach the answer. And we say, okay, problems with more intermediate steps must be harder. There are questions that are just factual recall questions. And then there are questions that are like analyze and argument questions. And so, you know, cognitive scientists say that analyzing an argument is more cognitively complicated and more difficult than just retrieving some trivia. Like, oh, I heard in class that like, you know, water freezes at this temperature. You know, and what I hear you getting at is that even if we could define hardness, it's not a single dimension. A, you know, a question, you know, characterizing it by, a, you know, a single gradient of hardness is probably losing some information. There's hardness from a, you know, a reasoning perspective, hardness from a language perspective. I think that's a great way to describe it. Yeah, yeah. If, if you want to boil it back down to one ultimate thing we care about, I think it's labeling difficulty. It's, can we get the correct answer to that question in our data set? If you're concerned about, you know, is the model helpful in this domain, even when I can't label data for it, it's about labeling difficulty. What did you find in terms of the relationships between easy to hard generalization and model scale? When we looked at scale and, and what we did was we had models, which are all open source between 7 billion parameters and 70 billion parameters. Um, when we're looking at our main metrics of success here, which is performance gap recovered, how effective is that easy supervision 
as a fraction of the heart supervision's effectiveness. It was consistent across model scale, which was really interesting to us. So the, the, the 7B model, uh, when we were looking at a setting like NMLU, the high school data was you know 99% as effective as the college data at the 7B model level. And then at the 7D billion parameter model level, it was also basically 99% as effective. I guess one interpretation could be that if you're using pre-trained models without any instruction tuning, you're just doing instruction tuning. Like you're teaching the model like about human questions and answers. Did you compare to non-domain specific instruction tuned models? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, th I think the, f the phrase that I like best here is task specification. What is the task that I'm supposed to be? I'm getting I'm getting four examples in my prompt, or I was fine tuned on you know a small data set. Uh, from the model's perspective, the question is like, what is the task I'm supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be doing you know word math problems, or I'm supposed to be doing uh, you know college chemistry at like a you know chem two hundred one level or, or something. Um, and and those examples help specify the task. Uh, you know, that model is not, you know, it's not supposed to just be regurgitating likely text that it would have seen on the internet. It's supposed to be like truly answering chemistry questions. And we don't think, you know, let me contrast this here with the view that we're not, we're not teaching the model anything new. We don't think we're teaching the model anything new. It already knows the knowledge. It already has the skills. We think we're, by, by task specification, you can think, it's like, which knowledge and skills are, is the model supposed to be using in order to answer these questions? And we want to, we want to tap into those existing skills and um, sources of knowledge in the model. And, and we think that's really where the, where the improvement comes from. You know, an interesting question for me is like, can we compare the performance gap with a model that is, you know, tuned, trained uh, on kind of third grade level instruction tuning types of prompts that are not domain specific. So non-task, but, um, you know, at the same level of complexity by some whatever measure. Um, is that something that you looked at or, you know, thought about? Yeah. So that's, that's a really good question. Cause you think even, even the third grade questions are at least still in domain, but you might, you might, you want to know, okay, what, but what if we have non-domain specific what if what if the task is just answer questions truthfully so we just write down some super super simple questions like you know what color is the sky usually and and we just get you know get the model to say okay i'm supposed to be answering questions truthfully yeah so we have added some experiments for this uh right at the tail end of of the project so actually these results are not in the archive version of the paper but we ran some experiments where we did try like domain agnostic prompts and and they're also super easy questions because it's like we're trying not to increase the difficulty. We're just tr we're trying to keep the difficulty at like a completely trivial level, like no higher than third grade. But it's just domain agnostic, and it definitely helps. Actually, those prompts are helpful. And so we had four comparisons. I would say super roughly, it seems like about half the effect might come from like domain agnostic, I'm supposed to be answering questions truthfully kind of task specification. And then about half the effect comes from, I'm supposed to be truly answering like biology questions. Like that's my job. Uh, how does this idea of easy to hard generalization translate to this broader area of oversight and safety that you care about? Okay, so you might have a setting where like, we, we want the model to be recommending uh, let's say like new drug trials to run for some like disease treatment, gathering the data for this and getting like good ground truth. So, like here's the trial we ran and the results and the effectiveness and like, what would you estimate the effectiveness? To? So like we, we could gather that data set, get the model to estimate what's, what's the promise of this new trial we're, we're thinking about. How helpful should I expect the model to be if I can only train it on like the labeled data that I have that's easy for me to collect? So maybe, maybe I'm just doing this like, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to get it to answer questions truthfully. I'm just trying to get it to answer questions truthfully about drug trials. I'm just trying to get it to answer questions truthfully about all these drug trials we ran in the 80s that we have this annotated data set for or something. But I don't want to spend, you know, like a million dollars running a bunch of new trials and like getting all the experts to like annotate the, the questions correctly. If, if we have experiments that show that this kind of easy to hard generalization is consistent across all these domains, the upshot of that would be 
we don't ultimately have to go through the data collection process and even the expensive evaluation process in order to still trust that our model was reaching that performance level we want it to be at. You know, we envision these models putting together information that, you know, they've been exposed to in new and interesting ways that comes up with new cures for a disease, for example. Extrapolating knowledge is kind of different from, you know, doing better on, you know, questions that are probably kind of already in the training data set already. Like, how do you start to characterize that? Okay. If we reach the point where we have a robust body of evidence that is... <laughs> pattern holds across all these domains you know that if was carrying us. a lot of weight in there <laughs> oh yeah absolutely like i said totally i mean when we're looking at this problem totally tip of the iceberg i mean so our, our paper came out uh, uh maybe a month after opening i put out a paper on on you know very similar topic they're looking at a, a slightly different framing which weak strong generalization but they, but then they also have a couple experiments where they adopt the same kind of easy to hard set up. So yeah, I mean, I would say with current LLMs and using different notions of easy and hardness that I think we will care about in the future, um, you know, there might be two papers on this right now. I mean, all of our work is certainly building on a ton of existing work in understanding hardness and NLP data sets, compositional generalization, learning from noisy labels, and and so on, and, and domain shift. Of course, you know, there's, there's a lot of relevant prior work out there. But in terms of like calibrating our views about LLM usefulness in these settings, uh, yeah, there might be like two studies on this. So so definitely just need more uh, going forward there. To finish up, I'm curious, what research is most exciting to you now? What are you paying a lot of attention to? Who would you kind of shout out as doing really cool stuff? Yeah, I'd highlight some work out of NYU and, and Columbia on this. Uh, Miles Turpin, who's been at NYU for a while and working with and Sam Bowman's lab there uh, previously, uh, has has had a couple papers on this. Uh, Yonda Chin at Columbia, uh, working with, I, th I think his advisors are, are uh, Kathy McCohen there and, and, and Zhou Yu, um, have, have been working on, on similar problems, understanding, you know, how globally consistent are the things that the model says? Like, do, do we think of it as having something like stable underlying beliefs that it uses to justify its, its final recommendations? By default, it's just going to offer you an explanation. It's just going to say, here's why I said that. Here's all the reasons. And we know for a fact that those explanations misrepresent how the model arrived at the answer. There can be factors that were important to the model arriving at the answer that it did that those explanations omit. So it will leave stuff out that we know was important for the model giving the ultimate recommendation it did. And we can know that it can fabricate things. So it can claim that, oh, I see. the reason I said the answer was B was because of these three reasons. And actually, it doesn't even think one of those reasons is true. My intuition would be that it's always fabricating it and sometimes it's right. Or sometimes it's close or like sometimes, you know what I mean? Like it's, you know, it's, it's process is next token prediction. And sometimes that aligns with, you know, information that's in a layer or something, but not necessarily, you know, in a very fundamental way. I don't know. Am I thinking about that wrong? No, I mean, I think that's totally fair. Yeah. I, th I think, um, there's a couple different frames for like what LLMs are that definitely just suggest different priors on like the answer to like what is the model doing when it's giving you an explanation and the frame that is next token prediction generate human-like text absolutely that that frame suggests well it's just generating human-like text it's not i mean no one thought it was going to actually like stand by any of these reasoning steps but then there's the frame that like well, the models represent what is true or false. Like they have internal world models. You can say, what's the likely next paragraph, assuming you're like, this is an article from CNN or something. And also, is it true or not? And we know that models distinguish like between what is true and false and what's likely or not as, as text. And we know that when we RLHF the models and, and early studies have shown that if you're think if you want to ask, so one of the explanation faithfulness questions here is like, well, if the model says this is the reason for answer choice A, and then you ask the model a slightly different question, is it going to contradict something it previously said? Or is it going to continue giving stated reasoning, stated explanations that are consistent with previously stated explanations? 
like you would hope that a person would if they had like consistent internal beliefs and consistent justifications for their decisions. And absolutely, there are settings where the models will be surprisingly consistent, even when you think, oh, they're just doing next token prediction. Well, Peter, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us and share a bit about what you've been working on. Absolutely. What a pleasure it's been, Sam. Thanks so much. <laughs>